Welcome to Weddings Unveiled, the podcast designed to help you build a productive, profitable wedding or event business. Here's your host, Angela Profit. Hi, y'all. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Weddings Unveiled, professional tips and secrets on wedding planning and event design, where we take you behind the scenes of our past experiences in the industry and share with you what we have learned from them and how they have made us stronger. This podcast will help you grow a productive and profitable business to launch you into success within the hospitality industry. Today's podcast is brought to you by Care Of. Care Of is a monthly subscription vitamin service that delivers completely personalized vitamin and supplement packs right to your door. It is so super easy. I know it's a new year and so new health goals is a must because guess what? If you don't take care of yourself, how in the heck can you take care of anybody? So this year, make health and wellness a top priority with the help of Care Of monthly subscription vitamin service, whether you're focused on glowing skin, boosting your energy levels, getting more sleep, or just generally being healthy, you can build a vitamin routine that's made just for you and your health goals. So do something good for yourself and your health this year. They really make it easy to stick to the health-related solutions. So let me tell you, they've got this online quiz that's fun and it's super, super easy. They're going to ask you about your diet, your health goals, your lifestyle choices. It takes like under five minutes to find out your personal, scientifically backed vitamin and supplement recommendations. So you can find out where you're lacking with Kara's online quiz and get back on track to reaching your health goals. And I know that it can be super hard to know what vitamins or supplements you should be taking. They're very transparent about what you need and what you don't need. They even have supplement options if you're vegan or vegetarian to match your dietary needs. My favorite thing about this program is the supplement packs. They're customized just for you. So you have one pack that you take each day. You don't have to open up a bunch of bottles and pour out a bunch of pills. It's already done for you, people. It's perfect for those of us who are crazy busy and we've got that on-the-go lifestyle. And of course, you can try your progress with the Care Of app. You got to go over to the website and take this quiz. It is so easy and the results are mind-blowing. So visit TakeCareOf.com and for 25% off your first month of personalized Care Of vitamins, you can use the promo code APCARES. So again, visit TakeCareOf.com and the promo code for 25% off is AP. Cares. That stands for Angela Profit Cares. So take your vitamins. Hi, y'all. It's Angela Profit. Thank you so much for joining me on another episode of Weddings Unveiled. Today, I am super excited to talk with the leading international speaker and expert on the wedding business, the business of weddings and events. Alan Berg, he has presented in 14 countries, four of them like in Spanish, which is amazing. And he is one of 33 people in the entire world that is a global speaking fellow. So we'll have to hear more about that. Welcome, Alan. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Angela. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. And it's a pleasure to have uh, people to uh, listen in part of our conversation here as well. Yes, I'm super excited because we have not really covered how to be a speaker and much less a global speaker on this podcast. And so for those of you listening who are interested in knowing how things have happened for Alan and what was intentional and what just happened, listen up because he's going to share that with us today. Absolutely. Um, So for, Ellen, you're very, very, very well known in the industry. Every conference I'm at, you're there speaking. And so for those of you who don't know, Ellen, can you share with us your background and how did you even get into this industry? You know, 
it's one of these, it's the, I guess the typical story. Uh, a long time ago, I was in a job I hated and uh, my best friend at the time bought a franchise of a wedding magazine. None of us had been in that industry, but he through somebody else, again, one of those stories, uh, found out about this franchise for sale in New Jersey. And he bought it and called me up and he said, listen, I don't want a partner. I want a salesperson. I really want you. And uh, it was a straight commission job. I was not an employee. I was a 1099 uh, subcontractor, straight commission. So no, no salary, no draw, no minimum, no guarantee, no base, no nothing. That's hard. Well, yeah. Well, and then if we add to that the fact that I, I was in a job I hated, but I was getting paid really well and I had a company car and paid benefits mm. and I had to give it back. I had to go get a car because I didn't have one. My, my wife had a car, but I didn't. Oh, I didn't mention that my wife was pregnant. <laughs> oh, and no. My older, my older son was turning three. My wife wasn't working and I gave up the good job with the good pay and the company car to do this new thing that we had never done and what I knew was I hated what I was doing. I was never home. I didn't see my three-year-old son. I wasn't there for my wife. And it had to be better. It, it just had to be better. I was confident in my ability to sell. So I knew, gee, this has to be better. And I did that for five years. And we opened another franchise. And I, so I did sold for the two wedding magazines. And then I bought them. So my wife and I published the two wedding magazines for another five years. And then the franchisor wanted me to go work for them. So we sold them back the franchises and I went to work for them. And about four months later, they got bought by the knot. Wow. So some people listening might know me from the knot days. I was with the knot for 11 years. It's funny because it was exactly 11 years, April 1st of 2000, April 1st of 2011. And I was first the regional sales director running the Northeast and the East Coast sales reps. And then I was vice president of sales running all the local sales. So for the 17 regional magazines and the local sales online, uh, then I was vice president of sales operations. And all the while, I was speaking at conferences uh, on business topics. So if someone wanted editorial and trends and colors, they would get someone from our editorial team. But if they wanted somebody to talk about sales, marketing, things like that, that was me. So I, I never set out to be a speaker. I just started speaking back in actually back when I was publishing wedding magazines, I started doing it for my own customers. Because the interesting thing about our business, Angela, and you know this very well, the barrier to entry is very low. Yep. So people get in because they have a passion and a talent, but that talent is not usually in business. It's usually artistic, creative talent, whether they're a chef or a photographer or a videographer or a florist or a stationer or a calligrapher or whatever. You know, there are so many things that you, you can do and get into the wedding industry but that doesn't qualify you to have a business. So I was helping people have a better business quite selfishly so that they would keep advertising with me. Yeah. <clears throat> and I did this, but I never thought of myself as a speaker. And 2007, I was at an event for, well, it wasn't called ILEA at the time. Some of us know it was called ISIS before that. Yep. And and I, I was speaking at a beautiful hotel in Montreal, the Fairmont Queen Elizabeth, where John and Yoko had their love in, their bed in, whatever they called it. Mm -hmm. And I got off stage and somebody said to me, hey, Alan, that was a great speech. You're a great speaker. Are you a member of the National Speakers Association? And I said, what's that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, why, and why would I care? You know, I'm vice president of sales. Why would I care about this speakers association? But I had been doing webinars every month and I'd been speaking at major conferences in front of, you know, hundreds and, uh, and more people. And I looked it up and I looked up the credentials. You have to be a professional speaker to join. You can't join to learn how to speak. You already have to be a professional. And I read the, the credentials and I looked and said, gosh, that describes me. I must be a speaker. <laughs> so um, I joined. And I like to say the first meeting I went to, the first national meeting I went to, whatever Kool-Aid they were serving, I drank the pitcher because I just jumped in and said, oh my gosh, this is a, a, a skill and a talent and something you can do and learn to do at an even higher level, even though I was doing it at a, you know, it was considered a, a good level at the time. And I just went to conferences and I went to sessions and I, I, I just soaked up everything I could and I started studying speakers and you know like any other skill the more you do it the more you study it the better you're going to get 
And in 2014, I got my certified speaking professional, which at the time there were 700 in the world. Now there's about 800 in the world. Wow. So you have to be a member of national speakers or another similar group. There's 15 like that around the world uh, that are part of the Global Speakers Federation. And then this past summer, I got my uh, Global Speaking Fellow, which is through the Global Speakers Federation, which there are only 33 in the world, because you have to be a CSP or equivalent and speak in various parts of the world. And, and I've spoken in 12 countries, two more coming up. Um, so I qualified. I mean, I, it, a lot of people will speak, but they'll go back to the same places. So if I spoke only in the US, Canada, and Mexico, I could never qualify for that. If I spoke only in Europe, I couldn't qualify because, you know, it's funny when you go to Europe, I was just in, in Ireland for like the I don't know, eighth or ninth time. Um, their countries are like our states, right? If you think about the proximity of England to France or to Germany or, or you know, uh, or Italy and all these places, Spain, you know, when my friends in Ireland say, hey, we're going to France on, on holiday, I'm like, oh my gosh, you're going to France. I'm like, wait a second. That's like, you don't want to ever be perfect. I learned that when I did martial arts, they taught us not to be perfect, just be better than yesterday. Don't try to beat anyone else, just try to beat what you did the last time. And that's what I do, you know, write the next best speech, give the next best speech, do sales training better, uh, write, a, write a better article, write a better book. Just what can I do that's better than what I did the last time because then you're always moving forward. Uh, and then you wouldn't worry about competition. You know, people tell me all the time, worried about my competitors copying me. I said, well, if you're always doing something new, yep. you shouldn't worry about it because by the time they copy what you're doing today, you'll be doing something else. That's right. And, you're 10 steps ahead. Right. And that's the way I look at life. You know, I know you do that and I do that. It's copy what I'm doing. I'll tell people what yeah. I'm doing. I'll tell them how I'm doing it. Yep. You can't be me. Yep. You'll put your own spin on it and you'll, you'll figure out a way to make it your own. And that's great. But I can tell you exactly what I do. It's not going to make you me. Nope. Uh, I remember seeing Penn from Penn and Teller. He spoke at, our, at a conference I was at. And he talked about it. He talked about stuff. And he said, I'm going to tell you and describe to you how I'm going to eat fire. And then I'm going to do <laughs> oh. it. And you're still going to be amazed. Even though he's describing exactly what he's doing, he's giving us the trick. And, and they're famous for doing that, telling you how the trick is done. And then doing it. And you're blown away anyway. So I, again, I, will, I help people all the time that they want to be better speakers or writers or whatever. I help them because you're not going to be me and don't try to be me. You should never try to be me. And that's not being egotistical. You shouldn't try to be me because you're not me. You're you. I'm not trying to be you. You just try to be the best you you can be. And if your you is better than me at something, good for you because yeah. I'm trying to be the best me I can be. And if your you is better, good for you. Good yeah. for you. We have a saying in the national speakers, we're not trying to get a bigger piece of the pie. We're trying to create a bigger pie. Yeah, I love that. Well, and you even said, um, you know, a little bit ago how there was something that you said that just really resonated where your past experiences, no one else has that exact path. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, there's planners that think I'm crazy. They're like, why do you sell these webinars? And why do you get up and tell people how you do it? And why would you do that? Like, what's wrong with you? And then there's, <laughs> I'll get these Marco Polos and these text messages now where like, so-and-so is copying your floor plan. And it's, it's almost cute. I'm like, thank you for acting protective, but actually yeah. like I'll share everything I know because I'm 10 steps ahead because I am a risk taker and you're a risk taker. Otherwise we wouldn't be where we are. And I love helping others. I feel like it helps bring the entire industry up, but something else that you said that I just feel like people don't see that anymore is that why are people listening and hiring consultants who've never done it themselves? And <laughs> you invested in yourself to make sure you were a professional consultant before you actually started to start a business and do that. And I just, I don't know what it is with the generation right now, but I'm like, well, how many things, how, what you, you've planned and done 10 weddings and, and you're an expert now and Wow. Okay. Yeah, you know, there, there's been a, through the years, every once in a while, somebody will pop up. Yeah. They'll kind of criticize and say, well, Alan, but you've never been a fill in the blank, you know, caterer, photographer, whatever. I said, yeah, that's right. 
And I'm not gonna, never going to tell you how to take better pictures, cook better food, plan a better wedding, arrange flowers better, sew a dress. I'm never going to tell you that. That's not my expertise. Mm-hmm. But I've been under the hood of more wedding businesses. I have credibility in talking about sales. I have been a salesperson. I have, I have excelled to a high level. When I started in this industry, like I said, I was commission only. So no salary, no draw. And by the way, I got my car every day, drove around and cold called people. How many people in our industry have ever done that? Some. <laughs> Yeah. Not many, Not right? Many. I mean, like literally just driving up to a, a bridal shop or a caterer and just walking in unannounced, right? <laughs> that, was, that was my life there for, for many years. Yeah. And then before that, I was selling Chrysler cars, not because I had any grand plan to sell Chrysler cars. It sounds like my life, right? I never had, any, I never <laughs> had a plan to get into this industry. And I, my friend's father bought a Chrysler dealership. And a year later, he called me up and he said, hey, you know, we're doing really well. We need another salesman. You want to sell cars? I was like, cool. I think I was 21 or 22 or something. I was like, cool, that sounds like fun. It, apparently that was the interview because I got the job. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I did it and that's where I learned to sell. No formal training, but I learned to sell. And in six years of doing that, I, I was a pretty good salesman. I, they started a competition for product knowledge called the auto know competition because you auto know. It was a bad pun, but I didn't make it up. I just, <laughs> but I was the national champion. Yeah. And, uh, I got a big foam core check, like at a golf course, you know, $5,000, which is a mm-hmm. lot of money. It's a lot of money now. It was a lot of money back then because um, that was, I think, a year, is that the, like the year before my first son was born, maybe? I think was one one of the first ones. That was a lot of money for us. We were newlyweds. It was a lot of money. And I come back to the dealership and my sales manager said to me, you know, Alan, you know more about these cars than anyone I've met in 20 years in the business. I've been selling for about a year. I said, thanks. He goes, good, shut up. (laughs) (laughs) And the short story there is, which became the title of my book, Shut Up and Sell More Weddings and Events, is I learned how to have all the information, but not just blurt it out. I learned how to ask better questions, find out what people were looking to buy and help them buy it and have all that information at my fingertips should I need it. And I went from being a pretty good salesperson to one of the top 50 Chrysler salesmen in the country. And this was when Chrysler was a much bigger company than it is now. So, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dealerships all across the country, probably thousands of salespeople. And I was in the top 50 by talking less. So I learned how to sell, but that was a different kind of sales. That was showroom sales. You waited for Mm -hmm. someone to come in and then you had your turn at the next customer. So again, different. Then I went into this kind of sales and it was totally different. It was all cold calling, you know, just calling people up, making appointments, stopping in and whatever. Totally different again. Um, and each time you adapt. And, and that's what I've done is I've adapted. And my latest book, which is called Why Don't They Call Me, is about how to, how to respond to the digital inquiries. Because I'm a digital immigrant. A digital immigrant means when I started in this industry, we didn't have a lot of the technology that we have now. I had a cell phone, but it was in the days when the service was so expensive, you didn't want to use your cell phone. <laughs> it was so expensive. Um, I, had, uh, I had a computer, but I, it's funny, I think about it, my, my, which, which computer was that? I remember buying one and taking the 80 megabyte hard drive instead of the 40 megabyte hard drive, not gigabytes, megabytes, and thinking, mm-hmm. whoo I'm big stuff here with my you know, 80 megabytes. And it, we had an office in the home. See, my, my, my sons are millennials. They're digital natives. So they've always known cell phones. They've always known computers in the house. They've always known the technology around them. Yeah. But we've had to adapt to it, we digital immigrants. So now I came along willingly. You know, here, here, I'm, here I am talking to you and I have my iPhone 10 in front of me, my uh, Mac desktop, my MacBook Pro, my iPad, my yeah. Apple Watch. I love technology. Yeah. But I was able to do business when it didn't exist because I used what I had at the time. Mm-hmm. So this latest book is about how to have real conversations without them being verbal conversations, written, email, text, WhatsApp. So when we, you know, we talk about global, which is we're getting around back to that, yeah. I never used WhatsApp because in this country, in the US, none of my clients use WhatsApp for business. Uh, so... I knew it existed because I knew, I think, was it Google bought them or Facebook bought them? Somebody bought them for a billion dollars or whatever. Mm-hmm. I, I knew that, but I was like, all right, I, I don't need it. And then I started traveling internationally and people were like, hey, you know, can I WhatsApp you? And I was like, um, sure. <laughs> Let I'll me get on that. <laughs> Let me get that app. And now I'm on the home screen of my, uh, my iPhone here. 
I have Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, mm-hmm. regular messaging. I have ZipWhip, which I use for my business texting. So if you go to my website, you can text me. It's actually texting my office number, my landline number. And uh, so I have ZipWhip on there so I can see that I get a message over there. So I have those plus telephone and email. So one, two, three, four, five, six, right? I have at least six different things on the home screen of my iPhone, which are all communication based. And only one of them is verbal. Yep. So where how to have these conversations is, has been a real sticking point for a lot of the people that I run into over the years. And I, I get all my topics from people I meet at conferences. Uh, you know, they tell me their problems or people I do consulting or sales training for, and I find their problems. And that's when I write the next article or when I write the next book um, or presentation is it based upon these conversations. And that came up all the time. That's why the title is why won't they call me? People go, it'd be so much easier if they would just pick up the phone and call me. Yep. Uh, and I said, you know what would, and I was going to write the shortest book ever. The cover was going to say, why don't they call me? And you'd open it up and the first page was going to say, get over it. <laughs> and then that would be it. The book would be done. <laughs> and it would probably sell so, a million copies. <laughs> yeah, it, it probably would sell a million copies. Um, but, you know, the, the, the idea there is I love when I get feedback from people People ask me, you know, what what keeps you going? I'm going to fly 125,000 miles this year and, and yeah. be in, I don't know, five countries, six countries, whatever. What keeps you going? What keeps me going is the feedback. I had somebody email me the other day. And one of the things I talk about in the book is you if you get an inquiry, not a cold call, right? Not, not you taking a wedding show list and cold calling people. If you get an inquiry through your website, through Wedding Wire or The Knot or something like that, Facebook Messenger or whatever, you should try five times to get a hold of that person. And if you've tried five times over the course of maybe two weeks total and you didn't get a, you didn't get a response from them, you can walk away and say, I've given it my best shot. Yeah. And I lay all this out in the book. I've laid it out in presentations and webinars and stuff. And what I find, because we do some secret shopping, actually we do a lot of secret shopping. I love that. <laughs> it, most people give up after the first attempt and then some after the second. Um, I, I just did secret shopping for a group. They had me come in for a meeting. There were 12 people going to be there. We shopped everybody twice, once through their website and once through like Wedding Wire or The Knot. And so we did 24 inquiries and only got 18 replies. That's the first reply. We only got 18 replies. Of wow. the 18, only five tried a second time. So I got an email from a guy that I had, um, I met him at Wedding MBA recently but um, he had heard about me or heard webinars or stuff before. And I laid out this five-step thing. So you can, uh, the short answer is today, tomorrow, try a different method a day or two later just in case it's going to spam. A few days later, one line, or you're still interested in planning for your wedding, catering, officiating, whatever it is. And then if you haven't heard back, try something funny, you know, something different, a bullet point list. Haven't heard back from you. I can only imagine it's one of these reasons. And then you'll have, you know, you've chosen somebody else. You're still interested, but you got busy. Um, you're, you want me to stop contacting you other than something funny. And this guy tried this and he right around Thanksgiving weekend. And his funny one was his fifth thing. The fourth thing on there was that uh, doc from back to the future came and put you in the DeLorean and you're stuck in 1955 without email. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and and he That's said great. he tried it three times and all three people re-engaged with him. So what he thought were dead, that they hadn't gotten back to him, all three re-engaged that they still want to talk about the, in his case, the band, the entertainment for their wedding. Wow. So when I get that email and he's telling me, hey, you're three for three with me trying this. That that's my payback. My payback is it's having an effect. Or I got a text this morning from a guy. I'm working with this uh, DJ in Indianapolis, Indiana. He's 22 years old. A really fun story. Been DJing since he's 12. Did his first wedding, Aww. family wedding at like 15 or 16. Um, so he's got 10 years DJing. He's 22, and he's, wow. I've done some consulting with him. Um, and he, I, I've shown him how to not lower his price so much. I've shown him how to stick to his price and, you know, and he texted me this morning and it, it sometimes it's cryptic from him, but it, this morning it was, uh, thank you for all your advice. Deposit paid on the 15th last night and waiting on the contract. Definitely glad I haven't negotiated down like I did last year. Uh, besides once for a Friday for a bride I went to school with, I've started to learn that I definitely not never want to play that price game again. That's awesome. Right? 
and, and, and this is the same kid, by the way, when I asked him how much he was spending on um, advertising because he was doing it part time while he was in school. And he said seven or eight thousand dollars a year, and he wasn't doing that many weddings. And I said, "Wow, you know that's that's a, that's a decent amount of money, but yeah. for, the, for the amount of weddings you're doing, that's a lot of money." He and he said this to me, and I, I, this would be a lesson for everybody. He said, "Alan, I'm not advertising for the business I have. I'm advertising for the business I want to get." Oh, interesting. And that's something that people twice his age haven't mm-hmm. learned is that yep. if you're trying to increase your business, you don't advertise for the business you have. You advertise based upon the business you want to get. You invest towards the business you want to get. And th- those kind of things, th- those are the things that make me excited. You yeah. know, the, yes, the money is a result. The money is not the, the drive. Anytime I put the money first, it never works for me yep. because it's, it's ingenuous. There has to be a value to the other person or the other company and when there's a value to them, I will get my value back. Absolutely. I mean, it's funny. I was just talking to um, a floral designer and he said the exact same thing. He, I'm like, what drives you? And his number one um, just challenge was burnout. And he said, you know, I really do love to help people because that is my drive and it's what drives me every day. But I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we own a business and we do have to make money. And that's why I told him I have to have like a bulldog, like someone to protect me because I would just say, yes, yes. You know, it's like you do want to help everybody, but you can't. There's only so many hours in the day. And so you have to learn how to pre-qualify who is going to actually implement and get results from what you're sharing and teaching. And it's not for everybody. So it's awesome that you know, like your passion, mine too, is driven by making people happy and not just happy, but it's like they're happy because they're getting results implementing what you have shared with them, which is really, it. to me, it's priceless when people are like, oh, how much is this and how much is that? And I'm like, if you're so focused on a number, I'm probably not the person for you. <laughs> but so, you know, I actually have a phrase for that. I tell people when, when someone keeps coming back and it's price, 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 I say, listen, if price is the most important factor when choosing your fill in the blank, your planner, your uh, videographer, whatever it is, then I'm probably not the right fit for you because people like you don't choose us because we're the lowest price. They choose us because, and then you have to have that value there. Yep. And if you don't understand what you're really selling, because what you're selling is results, you're not selling the price. Um, I actually spoke about this at Wedding Wire World recently, and I said there's a difference between value and price. You set the price, the customer determines the value. Right. So Love if it. the customer's not willing to pay your price, then they're not valuing it to that level. And if you lower your price and then they make the sale, well, that's actually the value. The value is not the price you put on it. The value is the price they paid. So for me, if somebody comes and says, listen, you know, we need a speaker and this is our budget. I say, okay, well, if that's nowhere near mine, I say, well, listen, tell me about your audience. You know, what do you want them to get out of it? What's the value you want them to walk away with that kind of stuff? And I say, all right, I can do that. And here's what I can do for you. And I can do that, but I can do it at this price because this is my price. And if they say, well, there's another speaker, but they'll do this. I say, great. If you want that other speaker and what, what they're going to deliver, then please hire them. Yeah. But if you want me and what I'm going to deliver, then this is my price because I can do what I do at my price. Yeah. I can't do what I do at someone else's price, whether it's higher or lower, I do it at my price. So if price is the most important factor, I'm probably not the right fit for you. Yeah. And that's it. Then you can walk away and, and, and that's it. I, I was in India recently and negotiating is cultural, right? Everybody negotiates for everything. Mm-hmm. But I, there's 300 wedding photographers in Bangalore. And I said, I'm fine with you negotiating. I understand it's cultural. I can walk into a shopping mall. I don't mean like a little shop. I mean like a real shopping mall and negotiate. I mean, they, they, they have a leeway, but they have a bottom. They have a point where they're going to say no. And you have to have a point where you're willing to say no. And walk away and feel fine about it. Every time I say no to someone because the price is below what I'm willing to take, I'm fine walking away because it was my decision. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm long past the days where I'm just going to keep lowering to get you know get the uh, the sale, unless there's some other value to me. In which case, it's fine because value is what I place on it and what they place on it. So when I say I'm willing to accept less, I'm willing to accept the value I'm getting back. 
and there could be another value. There could be another intrinsic value besides just the payment. And, you know, but, but, but we, we, we buy our value that we, that when we're the customer, we're buying value. So I just want to make sure that I'm bringing value to people and that value I get back in the reviews, the testimonials. So I, I will say to everybody listening here, if you're ever having a bad day and if you're ever feeling burnout, I'll say that to your florist friend. If you're ever having burnout, go back and read the reviews of the people you've dealt, dealt with recently and see what they're saying about what you've done for them. Mm-hmm. That doesn't in, it just energize you and get you excited, then it's time to leave. Yep, yep. And also too, I feel like with our our clients, the older I've gotten and the more I do, they seem to be entrepreneurs who understand value because the people that try to go back and forth with price, it's like, listen, this is how I make a living. Mm -hmm. And I don't ask you how you make a living, but you make a living obviously because you're sitting in my office. You I'm right. assuming you can afford something that I have. Right. Um, and so I have to educate people like, because in our industry, so many people are hobbyists and they do it for fun. Right. And I'm like, this is the struggle I'm up against all the time is I'm, I'm a business and yes, it's fun. And yes, it's rewarding. It's a lot of hard effing work, yep. but it's my passion. But at the end of the day, I have one focus and that is making the wedding perfect and that comes with a price when you're hiring experts and so right. I've learned well, that- and an expert for anything right it's yeah. not just an expert in weddings it's an expert for anything if you want something done at a high level you have to hire someone who already has that experience i, I compete against free and you compete against free Right, you compete against the the friends, the relatives, the sister, the whoever, or the yep. or the or the bride or groom who's going to plan their own wedding. I compete against free because there's no shortage of people that want to get in front of a room and speak. There's also no shortage of people that would rather have root canal than get in front of a room and speak. <laughs> and and the thing is, I tell people I, I didn't set out to be a speaker. I started speaking and I became a professional speaker. If you have goals to become a professional speaker. Uh, I will tell you this, the business of speaking is a tough business, just like the business of weddings is a tough business. My business, it's amazing the parallels of my business of speaking, consulting, and sales training, how it parallels wedding businesses. I'm a solopreneur, very much as if you were a planner and it was just you, a photographer, it was just you, and or whatever. And the I don't have one revenue stream. I couldn't because I, I couldn't make the living I need to make just by speaking. Right. But because of speaking, I'm able to do sales training, website reviews, business consulting. Uh, I've, I'm able to sell my books and products, right? So I'm able to do mastermind groups. So all of these different revenue streams are what makes my business successful. If I just wanted to do it from speaking, it would be very, very tough. And again, because I compete against free. And interesting in our industry, how many associations want someone to come and speak for free or very little, like the cost of their travel. And there's no shortage of people that will fill those slots. And I say to someone, if you can't tell the difference of having me in front of the room and one of those people, then please have them come. Mm -hmm. Because people bring me in because they can tell the difference. And the good news is I only need to do a, a small number of events compared to the available number of events. I only need to deal with a small number of my uh, possible clients than the, the total. So my mailing list is about 16,000, my email list these days. I just looked yeah. at 16, 16, 5. And I'm going to do uh, 65 to 75 events a year. That's 16,000 people on the list. And then I'm going to do sales training probably for 20, right? Out of 16,000. Yeah. So the odds are in my favor that I can find 20 that will pay my price. I don't need the other 15,800 or 900 and whatever <laughs> to get right. it. And right. it's the same with your business. You don't need everyone to get it. You just need enough of the ones that do get it to know that you exist and see what the value you can bring them. So uh, when I decided to go narrow and deep in my niche of the wedding and event industry, I didn't know what deep meant. Uh, I, I decided that it was 2013. I made the conscious decision that I was not going to look for any business outside the wedding and event industry. If it comes my way, I'll consider it, but I'm not looking for it. Mm 
Mm-hmm. I do very, very little outside the industry. So weddings and events is not just weddings, it's weddings, it's corporate, it's mitzvahs, it's proms, it's quinces, it's whatever. But they're all related and tend to be a lot of the same businesses. Well, narrow and deep meant what? Well, a couple of things. It means when I write a description for a topic, it's going to be wedding and event focused. When I write a book title, it's going to say weddings and events on the title. Um, and um, that's what I do. Yeah. So since 2013, uh, when I already had two books written, they were both in their second edition by then, my next two books say wedding and event on the title. So shut up and sell more weddings and events. <laughs> And uh, why won't they call me? Why don't they call me? Eight tips for converting wedding and event inquiries into sales. Mm -hmm. Well, because of doing that, it means I'm more findable as an expert in the industry because it says wedding and event on the cover. Sure. I could take that book, strip out the uh, examples of weddings and events, and give it to a thousand other different industries. Totally. Make the make the, 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 the examples in the book examples for them instead of examples for weddings and events. Well, I did a consultation, two hour phone consultation with a guy in Romania because he bought Shut Up and Sell More Weddings and Events on Kindle on Amazon and contacted me and said, do you do consulting like this? And I said, yes. And we did a two hour consult. Mm-hmm. He then flew over to Ireland. He was just at the conference I did in Ireland um, uh, two weeks ago. Or no, last week. What am I saying? It was last week. Wow. So, so because of my book said wedding and event and the title, he found it, bought the book, hired me to do a consultation, and then flew over to Ireland. That's the craziness of the, the interconnected Amazing. world. But had it not said weddings and events in the title, he probably never would have found the book. So when you go, when you do your niche, the challenge when you do your niche and you decide what it is, and, and it's not just weddings, right? So you don't just do right. weddings a certain segment of weddings, whether it's geographically, demographically, psychographically, whatever, you have your your persona, your avatar, your ideal customer, Mm -hmm. as do I, as every business should. So I'm not looking for everyone. I'm looking for the right ones, and I will market heavily to those. I'm getting ready to do a a, a mailing now. So out out of my 16,000 change, I'm going to send out probably 50 packages. That's it. 50 packages to people that have expressed an interest in having me do sales training or they've done it, but not recently. And that's a very targeted list. And I will spend, oh, between the box, I had custom boxes made, the stuff that's going inside, it'll be 10 to $15 per package to go out. Sounds like a lot of money, but not when the first sale is worth thousands of dollars, the first one. So I know, you know, that it takes money to make money. So but I'm going to target to those people that are going to get their kind of results that I know I can deliver the kind of results that they want. And they're the kind of people that would be willing to pay for it as opposed to someone that says, listen, I can't afford that. I said, great, get a group together. Let's do a mastermind. Can't afford that. Okay. Um, buy a book, right? Buy yeah. an audio book, buy a, buy a Kindle book. You know, there's something starting at, you know, $10 or whatever of what I do that you can get help. Uh, if you choose to, Right. And, and that's the thing is that there are people, like, like you said, that, well, I can watch that on YouTube. Yeah, you can. <laughs> Same as having me come and train at your venue? No, <laughs> it's oh. not. But it's totally different. You can, yeah. And, but again, if you can't tell the difference or if, uh, and, and this is a little pet peeve of mine in the industry, so many people complain that they can't get their price and yet they try to get everything for free. Right. Every, every free <laughs> app, every free training, every free whatever. Um, you know, I, I pay for all the images I use in my marketing. I, I, I buy images. I don't steal mm-hmm. images. I pay for Vimeo. I pay for Dropbox. I pay for Animoto. You know, I get the better versions of it because I want people to pay me and I want people to see that I'm investing in me. Right. And if I'm investing, they're going to want to be on that train. If I'm doing everything on the cheap, if my website didn't look good, my first book is called If Your Website Was Employed, Would You Fire It? So if my website doesn't look good, people are going to say, oh, how good could his consulting be? How good could his training be if that's the way his website looks? Exactly. I mean, your website's awesome. I love all the call to actions at the top. It's amazing. (laughs) You know, I got to practice what you preach, right? (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Like I would, my next question is like, you know, I feel like we've already gone over this, but for our listeners who don't, who I guess are newer in this industry, like in terms of what's special and unique, like about what you do is 
I mean, you really focus and you listen on what our industry needs and then you, you mirror and you take that exact thing and then focus on it and deliver something that gets real results. And so I don't think that there's, in my eyes, like for you, and then when people say, well, who are your competitors? I'm like, I don't have any competitors. Like, like no one is a psychologist and no one implemented EMR, electronic medical records with technology. No one in our industry does it the way we do it. We base everything on psychology, technology. No one has that past experience anywhere in the, in the world because we do go around and speak and teach and network. Right. I don't feel like you have any competitors that have the experience that you have. I mean, just in owning your own business and making sure that you are sharp and you are staying ahead. And then all of the relationships with from the knot and then wedding wire, which we haven't even mentioned that yet, but you have emerged yourself in the largest and the biggest people and companies that rule our industry that people look to. So, yeah, and, and again, it, it was this organic thing, you know, uh, selling for wedding magazine became publishing wedding magazines, became working for the knot, became head of sales at the knot. I mean, you know, I was sitting in my house in uh, Hudson Valley in New York. We live in New Jersey now, but Hudson Valley in New York, my sales team was spread out around, around the country. And, and at the time, and this is going back into the, the early to mid 2000s, you know, I was running $35 million worth of sales sitting in, in my basement, in an office in my basement. <laughs> Yep. You know, uh, just crazy. Yep. And then when I left there, um, uh, I had a one-year non-compete when that was up. Everybody, you know, wanted to talk to me about working with them. I did not want to become an employee again, uh, at least not at that time, still not. It's been seven and a half years, probably not going to happen. And uh, Wedding Wire was the natural choice. I knew Sonny and Tim from the early days because I always knew my competitors and I really liked them and respected them. I loved their focus on education. And you know, it's been a great relationship. Uh, we're about to renew uh, my agreement again with them. And, you know, I, like you said, nobody's got the same experience. Mine is certainly unique in this industry because, you know, who's run uh, sales at something like The Knot? Who, who does sales training for Wedding Wire as well as speaking for them and doing business development? I also consult to Weddings Online in Ireland, Dubai, and India, Guides for Brides in the UK, Easy Weddings in Australia. You know, nobody else has that experience. No. And, but, it, but I don't have the experience that somebody else has either. And, and that's the thing is we all bring something unique to the table. Yeah. So when, when, what you're, what you're trying to do, and I, I express this, and this might become a book one of these days, it's definitely presentations already. Why should they hire you? Not what do you do? Cause what a planner does, every planner does. If I make a bullet point list of what a planner does, the high level bullets are going to look exactly the same. Right, so you're going to help people organize their wedding. You know, you know, listen to their ideas. You're going to bring their ideas to life, make them better, make them stress free. Yeah, you mean you've seen that kind of a list. Don't sell that because if you're selling that, anybody else can fulfill it. Sell what they've never had. So what you said earlier about me listening, um, that's the again the, the shut up and sell more. The subtitle is ask better questions, really listen to the answers, and close more sales. If you will give people a chance, they will tell you exactly what they need. Um, I'm the keynote speaker at a, at a conference in February, and they actually, they've invited me. I was there three years ago, two years ago, not this year. They never bring anybody back a second year. They brought me back a second year. That's so awesome. they said, we couldn't bring you a third year. I said, I get it. I get it. You don't bring people back two years in a row. I get it. You can't bring a third. So then for next year, they contacted <laughs> me and said, we want you to come back. I said, great. And they said, well, we want you to be our opening and closing keynote. It's like, wow. That's, I, I was a breakout speaker twice, and now you want me to be the main opening and closing keynote. That's cool. So I, I talked to them, and I said, tell me what your theme is. Tell me what you want your people to hear. What's the, what the big pain points, all this kind of stuff. And I made notes. I made notes, and I kept listening for words that they said. And then I said, all right, let me, let me think about this. Let me get back to you. So I get back to them and I wrote descriptions up and I use their main words and phrases, the yeah. buzzwords, the, the things that they said were the theme and whatever. I said, okay, so for the opening, I'm thinking of this. And they're like, oh my gosh, that's exactly what we need. Right. And then I said, <laughs> for the closing, I'm thinking about this. And they said, oh, that, it, it, that's perfect. And, and my inside voice is going, well, you told me. <laughs> yep. 
you told me exactly what you wanted. And that's the problem is that most wedding professionals don't get out of their own way. They, they talk, 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 instead of just listening. And you're telling a customer what you think they need to hear when the 100% of what you know, they need 10% and everybody needs a different 10%. And when there's overlap between many of them, every once in a while you're going to ask somebody, so what, do you, you know, what are you thinking about this? And they say something and you'll, your inside voice is like, really? <laughs> that's yeah. really what you want? Of course, your outside voice is like, wow, yep. that's so unique. I've never heard that before. <laughs> your inside voice is like, are you crazy? No. Uh, so, but that's the thing is give people the chance. So my articles, my, my books, my articles, my, my presentations are all from discussions. Uh, I'm actually working on my fifth book now, and the, the book is going to be based upon articles that I've written over the last seven years because they're all these business topics, and my articles tend to be 1,000 to 1,400 words anyway, so every one of them becomes a chapter. Yeah. I'm going to put the book together from all of these you know, thoughts and, and things that are they're great topics because they came from you. They came from the audience. And, uh, you know, and then just things that, uh, you know, people have asked me and say, hey, what about this? And that becomes a presentation. Or things that interest me. I, I love doing crossword puzzles. That's my personal diversion. I do the New York Times crossword puzzle seven days a week in pen. I do have whiteout, but I use pen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, because it gets harder every day. You go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Monday through Saturday, it gets harder every day. Sunday is actually not the hardest. It's about a Thursday. Uh, in heart in, in difficulty, but Saturday is the hardest. And I I started thinking one day I was doing a Friday or a Saturday puzzle, and I I kept coming back to it because I couldn't finish it. I couldn't finish it, and I realized I just kept coming back. I didn't look up the answers. I, I kept coming back, and I said, "What can crossword puzzles teach us about business and life? What can the fact that I keep coming back and I'm not giving up and I'm I'm, I'm clearing my head and I'm going to try it again and I'm clearing it and then eventually I finish it and the satisfaction of finishing it because it was so difficult without I'm doing air quotes cheating it's not you know I will look things up sometimes because I don't know mythology or I don't know the characters in Shakespeare or something like that so if I'm really stuck I might look up something like that but I won't do it until I tried that puzzle five or six times. Yeah. So to me, what Crossroads puzzles teach me about business and life is, you know, it, when you have the easy puzzle and you just knock it off, that that's great. But was there a challenge? And I love the challenge. Uh, mm -hmm. Learning a new language at, at a certain age, I won't say what, but learning a new <laughs> language at a certain <laughs> age is one of the most difficult things they say you can do. And I, when I talk to people who are in Spanish speaking countries and they're like, well, why did you do this? And I said, uh, porque es difícil, because it's difficult. I did it because it's hard. I do it because it's hard. Uh, commit, committing to present in Spanish it was, a, it was a, pardon me, it was a ballsy move. I don't remember why I did that, but I did it. <laughs> and then once I did it, um, I said, I want to do it again. And it was nerve wracking and I was sweating and it, and I gave a 40 minute speech in about 18 minutes because I talked so fast and I, you know, but then I wanted to do it again because I wanted to put myself out there and say, I don't want my life to be easy in that way. Yeah. You know, I want it, I want to push and push. And I, so I wrote an article. Um, it's just like starting over. And I wrote an article about how learning Spanish and presenting in Spanish was for me a step back as a speaker where I had to speak from notes again and speak with my iPad again and things that I don't do in English and how humbling it was to do that but how satisfying it is after the fact. And I spoke in Cartagena, Colombia this year, and it was in an old opera house, and the pictures are just incredible. Just imagine speaking in an Italian opera house, that like, like from the wow. 1800s. That's what this building, this place was, fully restored. Just gorgeous. I mean, what, a, what an opportunity, right? I, and I stand there, and I, I, I step back, and I say, how lucky you know, I am to be able to be here. And if I had not learn Spanish, I might not be here. Yeah. And um, I was in India and there were two speakers that came from Spain, two photographers, and I'm sitting in Bangalore, India, having conversations in Spanish. How bizarre, right? It's just <laughs> it's bizarre. Crazy. But bizarre in a good way. Bizarre yeah. in a good way. Um, I, I, I've, I've gone skydiving eight months after open heart surgery. Something oh my people, gosh. So some people who've read some of my books, or, you know, might know about some of my health issues, but but why not? I live my life as wow. why not? Not to why. 
Not why should you, yeah. but why not? Yeah. And, and it's funny, we have t-shirts after skydiving that they sell at the gift shop there and they say, skydiving, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you think that with life, um, too often we're, we, we get stifled. And I've re- I speak about this in a presentation called Your Attitude for Success, which is also my second book. Yeah. You, you're afraid of the, the failure, so you don't even try. Yep. What's the worst that would happen? If you actually think about that, what's the worst that happens if I tried X and it doesn't work out? And to me, if, if the worst that happened is it, it cost me some money, mm-hmm. okay, so what? Right? Make more. Uh, that, that I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to make more money anyway. So what's, what's the worst? So opportunity cost. What's the opportunity cost of not doing it? What do you give up? What's the potential gain you give up by not doing it? And that's actually the mailing that I'm going to do now uh, to my uh, to these venues and caterers that, about bringing me in for sales training. Um, I'm actually having calculators made up with my logo on them. Mm-hmm. And I have this thing. All of my promotional pieces have a theme, and the theme is success. So I have battery backups for phones, and they say powering your success. And then I have phone stands, and they say supporting your success. And then I have these little cables that you connect your phone to the charger and they say connected to your success. I love I have it. Webcam, webcam covers and they say securing your success. Uh-huh. And now we're having calculators made and they, they're going to say multiplying your success. And the calculator is going to go in a box and the box is going to have a card in it and the card is going to be an opportunity cost worksheet. And it's going to say that at every stage of the four steps to more sales, we're always missing out on some opportunities. So how much is that actually costing you by not tightening that up? Yeah. So I say, put your average sale here. And then the four steps to more sales are get their attention, get the inquiry, have the conversation, make the sale. So if you're not getting their attention, how many sales are you losing every month because your website isn't right, your social strategy isn't right, either your SEO isn't right or whatever. Yeah. All right, put a number. And then how many sales at, at, at get the inquiry? If you're not converting that attention into inquiries, how many sales per month do you miss out on because you're not able to do that conversion? And put a number. And then at the conversation stage, how many people you're not able to convert that inquiry into a good conversation? Put that number. And then at the sales stage, how many people are you having the conversations, but you're not able to convert them to sales, even though they were a good prospect? And it's a total up those numbers, multiply that by, use the calculator that I just gave you because there's going to be one in the box, uh-huh. use this calculator, and then add this up. This many per month times 12 times your average sale, that's the opportunity cost. Now, which number is bigger? That number or the number to bring me in to help tighten that up. That's awesome. That's so awesome. It's a, I- little, it's a little kitschy. No, but, but it's good. Yeah, it's yeah, great. I, it's the creativity of it. I, I'm, the boxes are custom boxes. They're six by nine by three inches deep. Uh, they have a little cartoonish type character on the on the cover holding a stop sign. And it says, what makes your customers stop and take notice? And oh. that's going to be right next to the shipping label. And And then there's writing all around it. There's my logo and a wallpaper pattern around it. You open it up and if you turn the box over on the bottom, it says don't sell from the bottom up, sell from the top down. Oh my um, God. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. I don't even feel like I need to ask you like what, why do clients love you? I mean, you, I feel like you've thought of everything, but I mean. No, I'm always looking for the next thing. I'm looking everywhere for the next thing. Yeah. So I got an email about from this box company. And I started thinking, well, last year I did mailing and I did it in eight and a half by 11 inch padded orange envelopes. I said, I have to do something different this year. And I was thinking about boxes and I wanted to, so I wonder if I I can get boxes in a stop sign shape. Mm -hmm. And then these, this box company sent me a, 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 you know, a mailing email. And I was like, oh, I wonder what they have. And they didn't have stop sign shape, but I can make up my own custom boxes. And I started looking at it. And I went and I had them made. Now these boxes cost me five or six bucks a piece. Yeah. Just, and but then, and then the calculator is going to cost me. Then the postcard is going to cost me. The postage is going to cost me. Like I said, they're ten to fifteen dollars a piece, easy. Yeah. On these things. But when the first sale is going to be, you know, six seven thousand dollars, that's worth it. <laughs> right? Absolutely. Fifty pieces, fifteen dollars a piece, seven hundred and fifty dollars. It's worth it. Yeah. Uh, but you have to be willing. Well, first of all, you have to come up with the idea. Mm-hmm. Then you have to act on the idea, right? So it's, it's, it's many stages here. I'm, 
always thinking about what do I get? Like what, what, what does somebody send me or prospect me or walking through a store? Get your inspiration from everywhere. Don't only look in the industry. If you're only looking in the industry, you and everybody else is looking at the same things. So I, if I get a custom, I think what probably prompted me is I probably got some custom box in the mail and thinking, oh, that would be really cool if we had custom boxes. Mm-hmm. So that type of thing. Or uh, my business cards, I have bookmarks. So they're uh, um, two by eight inch bookmarks. Um, I have uh, regular business cards that are two and a half by three and a half. A regular business card is two by three and a half. So mine are a half an inch taller. I have, uh, you might have seen these when, when I speak, I hand out a business card that looks like a speech bubble. And instead of a regular yeah. card, because because it says on it, if you like what you're hearing today, please co-post your review at reviewallenberg.com. And but the card actually is a die cut of a speech bubble. So are you going to remember that? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and that's the thing. I say to people, if you hand them your business card and they immediately put it in their pocket or purse, you haven't made an impact. You've missed the opportunity to make an impact. Yep. So when I hand someone a business card, if it's a half an inch taller, you're going to notice it. Rounded quarters, thicker paper. Bookmark, you're going to notice it because of the size. Die cut card, you're going to notice it because of the shape. Right? So there's always something just trying to be different for a good reason. And that's a very important point. I, I, I don't want people to be different for the sake of being different. Mm-hmm. I want you to be different because you are different. Uh, when we changed our brand color from blue to orange, um, because initially my logo was blue and it was, I love the logo. It looks like a Swiss army knife. It still does. It's third iteration, but blue is a calming color. Uh, I'm not a calming kind of a guy. No, no. <laughs> I'm an orange guy and I've always been drawn to the color orange. I love, I, I love the energy and the color orange. So my logo is orange and my stuff always has orange in it. And I, it, um, when I speak, I'll always have something orange, whether it's my watch band or, or the watch itself or a tie or a pocket square, there's something there. Um, and just, you know, it, it's exciting for me to try to think of the next thing. And I got to yeah. tell you, they don't all work out. And when they don't work <laughs> out, it's so why. Uh, you know the Staples easy buttons, the big red easy buttons? Yeah. I had them made and they say reset on them because okay. I want I want my people in sales to hit the reset button before every conversation, whether it's an email, a phone call, or in person, hit the reset button. I always wanted to do this. Back with my days at the knot, I wanted to do this. Staples wouldn't sell them anyway except saying easy on them. So I finally had them made. And they cost me, you know, I, I probably the total cost of printing, the, making these things up was six, $700, something like that. Uh, selling some of them and I sold a few of them. Um, and then I still had a bunch sitting there, you know, and I'm looking at it's money sitting on the shelf. It's like, all right, you know what? They weren't the hit that I thought they would be. <laughs> so what? So you know what I do now? I make them door prizes and things at events and people love the fact that they got this button. So I'm still getting value out of them. I'm yeah. just not getting paid for the button. Yep. Um, so it's okay. It's okay. What's the way? DVDs. Oh my gosh. You know, when I first started, I was doing DVDs. When I left the knot, people were buying DVDs. Then computers stopped having disk drives in them. Yeah. People stopped buying DVDs. Well, I had a thousand DVDs sitting on shelves. What did you okay. do with them? <laughs> yeah. I have like 25 different DVD titles and I had all these different DVDs. So when I would speak at some events, I'd say, listen, why don't we do a swag bag and let me give you some stuff for the swag bag. Yep. And I had been selling these DVDs for $80 a piece on my website. I said, if I give, if I give everybody three DVDs, that's $240. That's the cost of a VIP ticket right there. And then I might drop in a phone stand or something else and they'll drop some stuff in. So we're handing them out. Is the content still good? Yes. But yeah. people just don't want to buy DVDs anymore. Um, and then I had CDs made and I still have some CDs left, not as many as DVDs. And then people stopped doing CDs. So I'm doing flash drives now. So I still, I sell my content in audio, but I sell it on flash drives because you can plug that in your car, put it down your phone, put it on your computer. So I'm, I'm following, you know, my, my audience with that kind of stuff. Yeah. But you know, audio books, I didn't do audio books. I was like, ah, I gotta go in the studio. I gotta do audio books. Ah, I don't want to take that time. And, and then finally, after the 20th person, no joke, asked me, do you have an audio? I was like, well, your audience is telling you something here. Yes. <laughs> and I 
didn't know what I didn't know. So I recorded the first audio book and I recorded it in the wrong format and the wrong bit rate and the wrong everything. Oh and no. I fixed all of that and got it out there. And then I knew what I didn't know. So the next one went smoothly. The next one went even more smoothly. And the last one went incredibly smoothly. And all four of my books are on audio. And I decided I started listening to audio books and that's the way that I read these days. And I read much more because I listen and I totally get why those 20 people said, do you have it on audio? Yeah. And, um, you know, follow the audience. Uh, and funny story, I was in London in October and I wanted, I wanted a scone. I, I flew an overnight flight. So 10 a.m. get in, 10, 10 p.m. get in, 10 a.m. My hotel room obviously wasn't ready. It was too early in the morning. And I'm walking around Piccadilly Circus and I'm walking and I passed this donut shop that had these ridiculous decadent donuts. Took a bunch <laughs> of pictures. Um, but I said, I don't want a donut. I'm in London. I want a scone. Because you can't get a real scone here. It's really hard to get a real scone here. So I, I, walk into, I go on to my phone. I go on to TripAdvisor. And I, say, I put in scones near me or something like that. Yeah. It takes me to this place. And they have baked goods. And I walk up to the young man at the front door. And I said, I, I'm looking for a, a real proper scone. Do you have them? And he said, you know, we get asked five times a day, but no, we don't have them. But if you go down the block, you'll see down the street, you'll see the blue awnings go to that hotel. Their restaurant has proper scones. Oh. And I'm thinking, hey kid, did you tell your boss that you get asked five times a day for scones? Yeah. Because five times a day, at least, right? And that's people that ask, not ones that come in, sit down and go, oh, there's no scones. I'll have this instead, right? That's five times a day. That's at least 35 a week that you could be selling. Uh -huh. if not more. And multiply that out by 365 days a year. If you just look at that and you say, well, what's, you know, what, what's five times 365? Uh, that, that's, at least, that's the minimum, right? The minimum is that is 1,825 scones. If those scones cost, I don't know, let's, let's call it three pounds a piece, is 5,475 pounds a year from <laughs> that. I'd be looking at it that way, going, your audience is telling you what they want. Bake some freaking scones, you know? Right. <laughs> what did he say? And, that, and that's the ones we know about, not the ones that we don't know about because people just didn't say, didn't ask, you know, or whatever. Um, right. So it's, you know, when you, when you listen to your audience and you say, well, what do they want? My audience wanted Kindle. They got Kindle. They wanted audiobook. They got audio. They want the books in Spanish. They have them in Spanish. Yeah. Uh, Personal goal of mine is to do one of my books in Spanish audio, which I don't have the, I don't have the time for that right now, but <laughs> personal goal. Uh, and another thing that's helped me, and I've written about this, I've spoken about it, is I never have more than three big things on my list at any time. Yeah. And I, and I call it my to do advice. list, not my today list. My today list is email and buying, you know, buying supplies and making airline reservations, whatever. That's today. To do is my next book, right? That's a bigger picture thing. Mm -hmm. And then to do is, let's say, to do the audio book in Spanish, let's say, like the thing like that. So when I look at the big list, I try to break it down into small pieces. So my next book, which is going to be based upon all of the articles that I've written in the past, I needed to get the articles together. So I had my virtual assistant take all the articles that I've done in the last seven years, drop them into a Dropbox folder, mm -hmm. and then make a spreadsheet and categorize, catalog them all and tell me what they are. Are they website? Are they sales? Are they social media? What are they? Mm -hmm. And so we did that. And the next thing was, which I just did the other day, is I took all of those articles, I put them together into a Word document. So all of these articles were in one Word document. And just to give you an idea, my last book was probably about a 30,000 word book. Wow. When I, in Word, this document with all of this stuff in it was like 86,000 words. So I'm not going to use all of it. But what I needed to do is I need to read all these articles again. I need to see if they're timely. I need to see if they need to be updated. I need to see if they have to go. Well, I dropped them into Word. That was one step. Okay. And then another day I went into Word and I made sure that every article was just a front and back on a piece of paper. Okay. Then I made the margins wide enough that I could three hole punch it. Okay. And then I went and I put them on a flash drive. I went over to Staples and and went to one of their machines and they said, I want you to print this out, two-sided, three-hole punched. Well, every one of those things was a different step. They didn't all happen on one day. Right. You have to take some of your to-do list and put it on your today list. Yep. And that's how I get more done. Uh, Spanish. I'll be driving in the car. If I'm not listening to an audio book, I have satellite radio. I put on La Politica. And now I'm listening to the news, the noticias in Spanish. And wow. seeing how much I can understand. 
and I don't understand it all. I'm not completely fluent. I am conversationally fluent plus, but there are a lot of things I don't understand that if somebody is not articulating, I might not understand it. If they're speaking fast, I might not understand it. And I, my vocabulary is limited. So my goal is, do I get what's going on? You know, yep. are they talking, oh, this is in Cuba. They're talking about this. Oh, this is in Venezuela. They're talking about that. Or this is, a, they're talking about the news here or something, you know, the, the, the Casablanca, you know, the White House or whatever. I, I'll, I'll get enough of it. And that's, a, that's part of it for me. Yeah. Um, I was doing, doing another podcast recently and I, I, I came up with kind of this phrase. It, it's, it's almost like every day life is a game mm-hmm. and there's another level. And I just want to get to that next level. But there's an infinite number of levels. There is no winning the game, right? Because it's a game against me. Yep. So the next level is what? The next level is the next book. The next level is presenting in Spanish in another country. The next level is going to a different country. The next level is, is what? It, 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 trying something you never tried before, right? It doesn't have to be big. It could yep. be trying a food you didn't try before. It, it could be making a, a, a connection you, you didn't have. It just... What are you doing different? Otherwise, you're going backwards, right? Because yep. if you're not moving forwards, you're going backwards. You got to oh, stay relevant. Right. And what are they, what's the phrase? If you're not the lead dog, the view never changes. That's right. I could talk to you forever and just keep going and keep going. <laughs> yeah, I'm, oh I'm with you on God. that. It's awesome. Thank you so much. Like yeah. the insight is so refreshing, but Tell people, like, I know that they can go to your website. What's the best way? I mean, you've got right at the top of your website, email Alan, text Alan. I remember I was in Napa at a women's summit, and there was a lady there, and she's like, oh, there's a guy, his name's Alan, and he is in the speaker association with me. (laughs) And then her daughter, who worked at Wedding Wire, um, at the time she was like, Oh my God, I love this guy, Alan. And she's like, let me, let me pull up his website. And I'm like, Oh, I know Alan. He is awesome. (laughs) And she's like, you have to reach out to him and um, you guys have to connect. And she was like, so excited. And so I got on your website and and I think I texted you a video. (laughs) (laughs) Oh yeah. I sent you a video. And then I think, I think I texted you too. Yeah. We use um, an app called bomb bomb and, um, it's just a different way to, you know, get people's attention. Right. And so I did. I sent a little video through Bomb Bomb, and I'm like, "Hey, Alan." And then I remember I got on your website too, and and you responded very, very quickly. And I think that that's one of the things that I so appreciate is just and appreciate about you and how you preach to people about great customer service and follow up and follow through. It's so important. It is the most important thing. Yeah. Pe- um, people are always surprised that I answer my phone yeah. and I answer my emails. Yeah. And I say, well, if I hand you a business card and I say, call me, I'm going to answer the phone. And yeah. it's funny. I'll answer the phone, Ellen Berg. And people go, uh, oh, oh is this Alan? <laughs> <laughs> I love like, it. Like, were you looking for Alan? And they go, uh, yeah. I said, well, then you got me. Yeah, you and, called my phone. <laughs> and I answer, and you email me. I feel bad if I don't get back to somebody the same day. And, and, yeah. I, and I have legitimate excuses of time zone differences. Like India yeah. is nine and a half hours difference in time zone. And just from the East Coast, forget about the West Coast. Yep. Uh, so, you know, I feel bad if I don't get back by the next day. But, you know, listen, my phone doesn't ring that much these days. That's not spam. Uh, I get a lot of emails, but when I get an inquiry, it goes into a different inbox so I can see that right away and yeah. I will respond. And I, I, I will say this, though. I don't necessarily follow my own five-step follow-up. <laughs> and the reason is because I am so busy. Yeah. And, and when I say I'm so busy, it's I don't want to chase down business I can't do. Right. right. Because the one thing I'm really good at is sales and I will make the sale and I've uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I, I'll knock wood here. Yeah. I've quite a few times this year. I've I've done the damage to myself by booking myself up so much. Yep. At the back to back, like I, I did two days of sales training in Mexico. I was home for less than twenty four hours, and and then I flew to India. Wow. So I was two yeah. hours behind time zone wise. I had to fly from Los Cabos through Houston to get home, less than twenty four hours home. 15-hour flight to Mumbai, six hours in the airport, hour and a half to Bangalore. 
spend oh five God. days in Bangalore, coming back doing pretty much the same thing. Home for four days off to Dallas. Two days in Dallas, fly home for less than 24 hours, go to London. Speak in London for two or three days, go straight from London to Orlando. I'm home for about four days or so, and then I go out to Wedding MBA. Yep, and I saw you out there. <laughs> Right. But, but that was that what you saw me was from the end of September to, to the beginning of November. Yeah. I had done all of that. Mexico, uh, India, Dallas. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed some stuff there. Mexico, India, <laughs> Dallas, London, Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky, Dayton, Ohio, then Las Vegas. That was just the end of September to November. Oh my that God. was a self-inflicted schedule. Yeah. So I don't, chase down the leads as much as I tell other people to do because the calendar is just full. So right. if I've reached out to you like three times, I might give up after the three mm -hmm. times because you're just, busy. <laughs> I'm busy. And it, it's not that I'm too busy to follow up. It's a, I, it's, uh, yeah, it's I, don't, I don't really want the next, well, I get it's it. Funny. People are like I, I did, I was in Louisville, Kentucky and the person was like, you know, can you come before the end of the year? I was like, ah, oh, mm. that was my inside voice. My outside voice was, let me look at my calendar. Yep. You know, uh, yeah. One of the most powerful words in sales is no, and I teach it, and occasionally I learn it, and occasionally I don't. <laughs> yeah. I, well, what's the best way if people want to get in touch with you or look at your books? What is the best way for them to reach out to you? So alanberg.com, A-L-A-N-B-E-R-G.com. Uh, email directly is alan at alanberg.com. Uh, there is a click. There is a link there for my shop, or you can just go to getallensbooks.com. Uh, if you do want the audio or the Kindle, just go on Amazon, and the shortcut to my author's page is allenberg.guru, G-U-R-U, and that'll shortcut you right to my uh, page on Amazon. If you're on Audible, you can get my books over there. But if you want to find out more about having me train your sales team or review your website or do a uh, mastermind day or something, allenberg.com. All the info is there. And Angela, you've already spoken to it. The links, there's so much redundancy on my site in terms of how to get to the different things. If you can't find how to find, if you can't find something on my site, it's probably not there. <laughs> right. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for all of your time today and all of your wisdom and insight that you shared. I know that I loved it and I know that our listeners will too. So Thank Let's you do this again. So much. Yes, absolutely. After the first year. Oh my gosh, there's like so much more to talk about. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. More we didn't speak that much about global speaking. <laughs> well, but honestly, I feel like you, to me, what I, my takeaway is like you started, it all starts with relationships and like yes. your friend, friend A and friend B were like this and this, but you've ended up expanding and learning new languages and it's like there's never the sky's the limit. You know, there's never a, a wall that you're going to hit and you're not going to keep moving forward with the time change and with technology. And by implementing all of those things, I feel like that's what has gotten you to be able to be comfortable in speaking in a global manner, which is absolutely incredible. Because like you said, most people, they would rather have a root canal, which I had one of those yesterday, by the way. <laughs> it was terrible. Yeah. But, I, you know, I love speaking. Um, yeah. But anyway, uh, I thank you again. And everybody, be sure to check out Alan's website and be sure to tune in next week to Weddings Unveiled. You guys have a great day. Bye. If you found this podcast helpful, please share it with your friends. And I'm so very grateful if you will leave a review. Be sure you are a subscriber so you never, ever miss the juicy details of Weddings Unveiled. Also, be sure that you're a part of my email list. And if not, you can sign up at AngelaProfit.com where I share valuable resources and exclusive products with only my subscribers. Before I go, I want to ask you, if you have a story or a product to share with the wedding and event industry, please let me know. To be considered as a guest on Weddings Unveiled, visit AngelaProfit.com and submit a podcast guest form. Until next time, remember to stay productive and profitable. You've been listening to Weddings Unveiled with Angela Profit. Join us next time for more insights to help you build a productive, profitable wedding or event business. For more great resources, head over to AngelaProfit.com.